uh, again, welcome everybody here. I want to thank Risk Free Associates for having me back again. I see some familiar names in the class, and so it's always good to see people back. Um, this title of this class is Open versus Closed Loop Mechanical Ventilation. And the reason I think this topic is worthy of a one hour CEU and worthy of talking about is because there are so many new modes of mechanical ventilation coming out that we need to be well versed in what these modes provide for our patients, what they do and how we can use them and how we can assess them. Because as they are smart modes, as some will call, um, they're not always as smart as what we think they are. So let's jump in here, look at our objectives. Uh, we've got uh, four objectives, basically. We are going to look to define open and closed loop ventilation. We're going to identify modes of open loop ventilation, identify modes of closed loop ventilation, so you're better prepared to deal with uh, your patients uh, in understanding what type of mode of mechanical ventilation you're in. And then we're going to evaluate several patient assessment parameters during opening closed loop ventilation. So we're going to finish this by looking at a lot of different scenarios and assessing how do we look at what is happening when we have patients in closed loop versus open loop ventilation. So first things first, uh, let's define open loop ventilation. Now I have an image here and basically what you see here is that it is a loop, right? So we see that right off the bat. And what we need to recognize is that there are several components to this loop, okay? Here you are right here, this is the clinician. So the clinician is involved with open loop ventilation, highly involved, okay? And so what we recognize is that the clinician tells the ventilator what to do by setting ventilator settings. The ventilator then supports respiratory support to the patient, and then there is feedback that comes back. This is what we call physiological measurements. These are parameters that we monitor during mechanical ventilation. But recognize that the feedback comes back to the clinician and then the clinician has to do something to change the ventilator settings in response to the physiological measurements. This is open loop ventilation. In other words, the loop doesn't close between the patient and the ventilator. There is a need for a clinician to be involved. And you're gonna notice here, there's this little thought bubble right here that says control target. You see, us as clinicians, we are the, the individuals who are deciding what our targets are. What are we doing to, and what changes are we making to affect mechanical ventilation for our patients? And we're constantly involved in analyzing data, analyzing physiological measurements, to say, okay, something's not right here. Our control targets are off and we have to tell the vent to do something different. Watch what happens when we look at closed loop ventilation. So this is a closed loop ventilation graph. Look what happens. Here's the loop. It starts here, goes here, goes here, and then loops back around to here. Notice that you, the clinician, is outside of the loop. And so what we see here is that the clinician is now responsible for telling the vent what the control targets are. So control targets, whether it's tidal volume, pressures, CO2, whatever it is, whatever it is that we are monitoring, that we need to be monitoring, we're going to tell the vent right here, this is what we are aiming to achieve. So the ventilator, the controller tells the ventilator what to do. The ventilator takes care of, provides support to the patient. Physiological mechanisms or measurements come back and they go back to the controller box, which is what we have told the vent to operate off of. Which means the ventilator right here will assess this data within the parameters that we have set and that will become what makes the changes necessary for the ventilator to provide subsequent breaths to. So essentially, open loop ventilation, you, the clinician, we're responsible for making ventilator changes for the patient. 
In closed loop ventilation, we tell the ventilator what we are targeting and the ventilator makes that assessment on its own and makes subsequent changes. In open loop ventilation, you leave the room, nothing is changing. In closed loop ventilation, you leave the room and come back, you may find vent settings that have changed. That's the difference in open and closed loop ventilation. And that brings me to some questions. So I'm gonna ask you right now, can we put them up in the chat bar? Let me see if I can get the chat pulled up here. Um, tell me right now, as clinicians who take care of patients being mechanical ventil mechanically ventilated, what are some questions that we should be asking during mechanical ventilation? How do we, what, what are we analyzing? What are we assessing to say, to make changes during mechanical ventilation, whether it's open or closed loop ventilation, what questions do we ask or what questions should we be asking? Anybody got an idea? Put it in the chat. Let's see what we get here. What asynchronies, if any, are present? Gerald, you're my new best friend. I uh, Send me an email after this. I want to talk to you. That's a 100% uh, great answer. Who else? Anybody else? What else should we be asking ourselves? Okay. Well, for time's sake, I'm going to move on. If you have any thoughts, feel free to throw them up there into the chat. If not, here's the five questions that in preparing for this lecture, I have come up with. Kim Sherwood, another phenomenal answer. Are we ventilating and oxygenating appropriately? Absolutely correct. So let's ask ourselves these five questions. I'm going to simplify mechanical ventilation for you. And, and, and yes, are there other questions? 100%. But you tell me at the end of this if these five questions don't set the framework for any other question you might ask. Question number one, are we protecting our patient's lungs? Are we employing protective strategies? Are we looking and monitoring for tidal volumes in, in averaging in and around the six ml per kilogram per ideal body weight range? Are we looking for plateau pressures less than, less than 30 centimeters of water pressure? Are we monitoring for driving pressures less than 13 to 15 centimeters of water pressure? Those are all protective strategies that we should be asking every single time we put a patient on mechanical ventilation and manage that patient during that time. Now, second question, are we adequately ventilating our patient? Kim, hit the nail on the head, 100%. Are we adequately ventilating our patient? Now we know as respiratory therapists, when we say, are we ventilating? We know we're talking about, are we adequately removing carbon dioxide from our patient's body? That's the question. This is what this is asking. So are we doing that? We should be asking that every single patient we have and also putting that CO2 into a relationship with the pH. So we recognize that these patients who live with higher CO2s we're adequately ventilating them, even though their CO2 may be 65. They have a normal pH. This is where they live. We are adequately ventilating. Are we adequately oxygenating? 100%, great, great answer here. Are we oxygenating our patient? If we do not ask ourselves this question, we are being neglectful to our patients. Let's just be real, right? We call a spade a spade. If we're not asking this question. We got a problem. But the question is, is, are we getting enough oxygen into arterial blood? That's the role of the ventilator. Now we know that tissue oxygenation goes beyond that. Do we have adequate cardiac output? So forth. But from the question of, are we getting oxygen into arterial circulation? The answer should be yes. And we know we should be asking ourselves that question. And the fourth question here is, are we satisfying our patient's neural drive? Now, Gerald said asynchronies, and this ties into neural drive because we know that if we have patients who have an increased neural drive to breathe, I mean excessively increased, then there are going to be asynchronies that present. Person, a patient with an increased neural drive is going to experience this need for more flow, this need for more volume, perhaps, depending on the scenario. Whatever it is, neurally, they are not satisfied. We need to be able to recognize this and treat this and take care of this, right? And if we do these four things, these four first questions right here, then what we should see is a positive outcome on patient, patient positive patient outcomes. We should see where we were able to get these patients off mechanical ventilation quicker. 
So this idea of, 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 well, what about the first question being, can we liberate them from mechanical ventilation? 100% I agree with that question. If we're not paying attention to these first four, it, 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 the, the answer is going to be fairly, fairly simple, okay? The last question I think we always need to ask is, is and are our patients progressing or regressing patient to patient to patient, from hour to hour, from day to day, from shift to shift? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? And what plan do we establish from asking ourselves all of these five questions? Now, you may be thinking to yourself like, what? Well, this just took a turn from open loop to closed loop ventilation to talking about mechanical ventilator management. Let me show you another diagram here that I ran across in one of the articles in preparing for this presentation. This is actually an image out of one of the articles I'll be referencing. Um, at the end of this presentation. Look at this closed loop design for mechanical ventilation. You have your controllers here. Now remember, you're over here. So this is the clinician. The clinician sets the controllers. Look at this, protective ventilation, CO2 controller, O2 controller, demand controller. Now they say demand controller, but demand controller relates back to neural drive to breathe. Okay. So, so, so patient ventilatory demands will directly proportion to be related to neural drive. Look at these controllers that we could set in this model of closed loop ventilation that we tell the ventilator to ventilate the patient. And then constant feedback is being analyzed back from the patient. I may be saying, this, okay, well, how's the ventilator going to assess all of these things? Let's talk about protective ventilation. Airway pressures and tidal volume. Exhale tidal volume and assessment of airway pressures, peak pressure, plateau pressure, all of those. The ventilator can assess feedback from the patient on what those numbers are. It just has to fit the algorithm that we're putting in to the controller. What about CO2 controller? Okay, Joe, how's the ventilator going to control arterial CO2? Well, maybe it can't, but it can make changes based off of in tidal CO2 connected to the vent. The vent can take a set of parameters and make changes based off of changes in in tidal CO2, which we know correlates to and is an indicator of arterial CO2 in most situations. Okay, well, what about oxygen then, Joe? Easy one, SpO2. Everybody's got a pulse ox on. If that pulse ox is connected to the vent and that pulse ox falls below the set parameters that you tell the vent what to do, then guess what? The vent says, oh, we need more FiO2. And it increases or decreases FiO2 based off of pulse oximetry parameters set, which again, we know correlates to arterial oxygenation. And then the last one here is the demand controller. So how would the vent recognize if the patient was experiencing an increased demand or not? It's a good question. And one that I think we need to address here and talk about. So what we know here is there's a couple of different ways this can be done. The first one is with the P100, occlusion pressure. We know that occlusion pressure is a direct reflection of neural drive to breathe. There are ventilators out there that can and do assess neural drive by measuring the P100 on every single breath. So if that, ner if that, if that neural drive increases and that patient starts to generate a more negative occlusion pressure, then the vent recognizes well something isn't right here, feel like we need to do something different and it makes an appropriate change, maybe increasing flow or whatnot. There's another statement down here where it's talking about an, an esophageal device that measures and detects diaphragmatic excursion. And so this is interesting because this is specifically really talking about NAVA, which we're going to talk a little bit about here in just a second. But we know that, that we can drop a probe down our patient's esophagus, place it at the approximate placement of the crux of the diaphragm, and we can assess diaphragmatic excursion. Now you may be thinking, well, what does that have to do with neural drive? Well, remember, 
If neural drive increases, the electrical impulse to the diaphragm increases, and this increases the, the magnifies the excursion of the diaphragm. So in other words, if a ventilator can detect the strength at which the diaphragm is contracting, then it can interpret this as an increased neural demand, which is very, very interesting to me. And if we think about these four elements right here, then what we see is we come back to protective guidelines, CO2 management, O2 management, and neural drive to breathe management, all in one ventilator. Now, I don't know if this ventilator exists. I haven't been able to find it if it does, but, but what a beautiful design that, that this is the day that this does become a reality. I think it's a good thing. Now, I, 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 get, I talk to a lot of respiratory therapists about this and they start getting nervous. They say, well, wait a second, if the vent does everything and we don't have to do anything, then what about our jobs? What do, what, what's our value? What do we bring to the table? Well, we're gonna see by the end of this presentation that there is still a cognitive level of assessment that only you have as a clinician and the ventilator doesn't have. The ventilator is only operating within controller parameters. And so it's very black and white. Does it meet the parameters? Yes, keep doing what I'm doing. Does it not meet the parameters? No, do something different. It doesn't contain and possess the ability to say, hey, this patient's not doing well. This patient needs something different. Maybe this patient needs another mode of mechanical ventilation, okay? So don't get nervous if you're thinking like, man, this, this is something that, that I don't want in my ICU because um, I need my job. All right, so let's talk now, just shift gears just a little bit and talk about examples of open loop ventilation. Now that we've defined what open and closed loop ventilation is, let's talk just a second here about some examples of open loop ventilation. Uh, the first one here is volume control. Now, when you talk about volume control, you, um, you know that this breaks down into multiple different types of volume control. You can have CMVVC, you can have ACVC, SIMV, VC, okay? I put that on there for completion's sake, but this really doesn't matter. What really matters here is that when we are in volume control, we know that we set a tidal volume, we set a flow, some ventilators set an eye time and not a flow. It doesn't matter. You set the parameters and we know that in volume control, pressure varies. And you can leave the room and you can come back two hours later and your pressures can be all over the place, the ventilator is not gonna do anything different. So it's important to recognize that volume control, open loop mechanical ventilation, you are a piece of the loop. You have to tell the ventilator to do something different when problems or parameters get um, fall out of our target ranges. Also with pressure control, we know traditional pressure control, you're gonna set an inspiratory pressure, you're gonna set an eye time, and you're going to set a PEEP and an FO2 and all that stuff. And the volumes are now going to vary. And the vent's not going to do anything about it. Those volumes could become as high as you can imagine, or even as low as you can imagine. The ventilator doesn't do anything different because you're the controller in open loop ventilation. And again, we can have CMV, AC, SIMV, pressure control. That's not a part of this conversation, just there for completion's sake. What about CPAP? We can put a patient on a CPAP of five centimeters of water pressure, seven, eight centimeters of water pressure. The vent does nothing different ever. The patient's just going to breathe on that higher level of continuous positive airway pressure. Um, that's all it's going to do. It's not going to change no matter what the patient does. Same thing with PSV, talking about pressure support ventilation. When you talk about pressure support, you dial it in, let's say we, we, we set the patient on 10 centimeters of water pressure or pressure support. Well, no matter what that patient does, no matter what, what, what respiratory pattern follows that, the vent does nothing different. Pressure support of 10, pressure support of 10, every single breath, pressure support of 10. You have to come in and assess and go, well, this pressure support of 10 is not appropriate. We need to do something different here, okay? And then we finally finish up here with examples of APRV, airway pressure release ventilation, and bi-level, depending on what vent you use. Uh, if you're working with the 980s, we know that's we're going to be referred to as bi-level. If you're working with the um, 
you know, the, I think the Bella Vista refers to it as APRV. I think the, um, oh, I can't even think of the vent now, the blue vent, um, whatever it is, this is the APRV, they call it APRV. Okay. And, and these, these modes do not do anything except for what you tell them to do. You tell them what pressure to rise to, what pressure to drop to, how long to hold at the pressure high, how long to hold at the pressure low, allow the patient to breathe spontaneously. Nothing's going to change no matter what feedback the vent gets. These are all open loop forms of ventilation. You, the clinician, are the controller. Well, let's look at some closed loop modes of mechanical ventilation because these typically get a, a, a little bit more complicated. You see them. A lot of people sometimes aren't real certain about them. We don't like to work with them a lot of times because we just simply don't understand them. If you'll spend some time with them, they will start to make sense. The first one here is pressure regulated volume control. And I, and I wrote these out. I didn't write the other ones out because we're pretty familiar with those other ones. These ones not so much, so I wrote the names out. Pressure regulated volume control. We know this is PRVC. I'm not 100% certain on this, but I feel like PRVC might have been the original closed loop form of mechanical ventilation. If there's a one that came out before that, I haven't been able to find it. Uh, but we know that PRVC, when we dial in the settings for that, we don't dial in an inspiratory pressure. And that's because pressure is going to automatically vary based off of a target tidal volume that we do set. So as the, as the clinician, now we set a controlling mechanism and say, hey, uh, ventilate this patient in PRVC, and we want you to target this tidal volume of 450 mLs. And then what the ventilator does is it operates in, in pressure control mode. Is so, so the name here is, is, is good, is it appropriate? But this volume control throws a lot of people off. PRVC is nothing more than pressure control that self-regulates to achieve the volume you tell it to. That's all it is. You set an eye time, you set a target tidal volume, and then pressure control breaths happen, breath to breath to breath, adjusting to meet that tidal volume that you're telling it to target. This is the same thing as volume ventilation plus or VC plus that you see on the Puritan Bennett ventilators. They don't call it PRVC, they call it VC plus. Same thing. You set a target tidal volume, you set an eye time, Pressure control ensues targeting that target tidal volume. Same thing for adaptive pressure control, APC. Not sure what vent it's on, but it's a mode that's out there. It operates identical to, these three are basically the same. These are all pressure control modes that self-adjust to a target tidal volume. And that's, that's, that's what they are. So you're gonna have a patient receiving mechanical ventilation, the vent is going to be in control. It's just going to be altering that pressure based off of your target tidal of volume that you tell the vent to deliver. Now let's, let's shift gears here just a little bit. And let's talk about volume assured pressure support. You see, we're out of pressure control now and we're talking more about pressure support. This is called VAPS. So volume assured pressure support. Think about it. The, the, what happens is in the name, we're going to provide support to a spontaneous breathing patient in the form of pressure support, but this pressure support is going to automatically change its setting to assure an exhaled tidal volume. And you guessed it, you're going to have to tell the ventilator what that target tidal volume is. So if you have a patient breathing, you know, tidal volumes are 400 and you're targeting 500, then this ventilator will automatically increase the pressure support to get that tidal volume up to 500 mLs. This is during spontaneous breathing. This is also true for proportional assist ventilation, except we don't really call it pressure support. Proportional assist ventilation, also known as PAV, also available on the Puritan Bennett vents. Uh, this is, I should probably say right now that this is not a sponsored talk. This there is no underlying conflicts of interest. I know I've said Puritan Bennett multiple times, but it's just to let you know that's the Bennett's on it. They have nothing to do with me or this presentation. Just want to clarify that. Uh, but proportional assist ventilation, PAV. See, this is an interesting one. 
And it's one that if you've never used it and you see it for the first time, you're looking at it going, what am I looking at right here? This is weird. What it does is it takes a very complex algorithm, a formula, and it takes in compliance and resistance and work with, it gives you an overall ultimate work of breathing for your patient, a work of breathing measurement for your patient based off of uh, joules per liter. And so what you do is you tell this vent to provide, let's just say 50 percent of the workload now a lot of places use it as a as a as a spontaneous breathing trial mode so they may only dial in 30 percent whatever just say 50 percent what you as the clinician just set the controller at during path is you told the vent to assume 50 percent of the patient's total work of breathing okay let me say that again assume you take responsibility <clears throat> for 50 percent of the patient's total work of breathing, which is breath to breath to breath being monitored by the ventilator. So if the patient work of breathing increases, then the ventilator provides more support because it now has to provide 50% of a total increased work of breathing. If the work of breathing decreases, then the ventilator recognizes this decrease in work of breathing and it says, Okay, I need to decrease the support I'm giving, but remains proportional to the patient's work of breathing at whatever you have told it to remain at. Okay, so you see it does something different. It offers a varying amount of support to the patient based off of what you tell it to. These two modes right here, PAV and VAPS, these are closed loop modes of mechanical ventilation associated with spontaneous breathing patients. So we recognize right here that not all closed loop modes of mechanical ventilation have to be full support, like we talked about with PRVC, VC plus, and APC. There are also closed loops related to spontaneous breathing patients. And then, as you can imagine, there are modes that do it all. And so, if you look at adaptive support ventilation, this is ASV, uh, this is a mode of mechanical ventilation that that takes in the patient's gender and height into account and establishes a desired minute ventilation based off of that patient's gender and height and based off of body weight. And what it does is it, 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 it literally moves, it allows the patient to breathe spontaneously. Say, hey, you wanna breathe spontaneously? Go ahead and breathe spontaneously. Do your thing. As long as you're meeting this minute ventilation that I'm told to achieve, then you breathe spontaneously. And it will provide pressure support breaths that will also automatically increase and decrease to help the patient achieve that desired minute ventilation. Now, let's say the patient finds himself in a situation, we're gonna look at this more in a little bit, but let's just say the patient finds himself in a situation to where they're failing to achieve that minute ventilation. Well, then guess what? ASV says, okay, you're not doing it on your own now. So now I'm going to now provide for you pressure control breaths targeting at a six ml per kilo tidal volume. <laughs> and not just stopping there, but also setting a variable respiratory rate to achieve that target minute ventilation, right? So you see where this mode will go from full support to full spontaneous support the whole gamut, it runs the whole thing. <clears throat> yes, auto mode survey would be very similar to ASV. Yes. I would, let, me, let me take another look at this with the height and gender into account. But this is something we're gonna see is a revolving kind of a story here as we go through here, we'll talk about this. So let's talk about neurally adjusted ventilatory assist. This is also known as NAVA. This is the one that I think we all are familiar with. You get an esophageal probe that goes in. I told you earlier, it sits at the crux of the diaphragm and it measures diaphragmatic excursion. And it provides pressure support to the patient towards a target controller. And if that controller is not met or if that patient fails to, to spontaneously achieve the goals, then it switches also into pressure control. Now, this is interesting because you gotta be 
you know, understanding, well, why is my ventilator going from spontaneous to full support? Why are we in pressure control now when we were in pressure support a little bit ago? This is where you become valuable to closed loop ventilation because the ventilator is incapable of understanding, okay, well, well something's happening and things are changing. It can't interpret why, okay? So I want to point out to you while we're, while we're talking about these closed loop modes of mechanical ventilation, you want to be on your toes with these modes because a lot of them require you to have the right size of the patient dialed in to the, the ventilator. And when you're talking about path, you also have to have the right size in the tracheal tube dialed into the, to the vent. The vent needs to know the size of the patient. So all the parameters it's looking for and looking at is based on the right size patient. So keep that in mind when you're working with these modes. Okay, so those are open and closed loop modes. Let's look at some scenarios so that we can achieve our fourth objective. We've achieved one, two, and three. We need to achieve the fourth one now. And that is how do we assess our patients in open versus closed loop ventilation? Let's take a look at it. Uh, so I got a scenario here. The scenario is a 70 kilogram male patient receiving continuous mechanical ventilation in the volume control mode. This is extremely important right here. Volume control mode. We have a set tidal volume of 420 mLs, which is based off of six mLs per kilogram. So we are protecting our patient's lungs by, by approaching the correct size tidal volume. The preceding eight hours reveal the following findings. Now we know that there would be interjections made before all of these eight hours happen, or at least hopefully, right? Just go with me here just to see kind of what the trend looks like so we can see what change is happening in these modes. So at eight o'clock, our tidal volume is 420 and our plateau pressure is 18. Okay, everything is good right here. At 10 o'clock, our tidal volume is still 420. Why is our tidal volume still 420? Because we're in volume control and we're set on 420 because it's an open loop form of mechanical ventilation. At 10 o'clock, 420, our Plateau pressure has gone up from 18 to 24. 12 o'clock, 420. Plateau pressure up to 28. 1400, still tight of volume of 420. Plateau pressure up to 32. What does this tell you about your patient's compliance? Anybody in the chat bar, you can tell it how. Just put it up there. We'll just make this interactive. Decreasing compliance. That's exactly right. And I love the way this is said, decreasing compliance due to any number of factors we need to investigate. Remember I told you, don't be afraid of closed loop because this is the investigative part that we're going to be a part of. Now, this isn't closed loop, but just like, like Gerald just stated, we've got an increasing plateau pressure, which we know is associated with a decreasing compliance when we're in volume control. We, being a part of the loop, need to do something different, and we need to assess and figure out why we are losing and have a decrease in compliance, okay? Now, let's go to the next scenario. Now we have a 70-kilogram male patient. They're receiving continuous mechanical ventilation in the pressure control mode. Now, we know we're going to have a set pressure, but we're still going to target a tidal volume, and we're still going to target six mLs per kilogram. So we're still looking for 420, okay? During pressure control, we still want to protect our lungs. So we're looking for a, a tidal volume in the range of six mLs per kilogram. At eight o'clock, we have a peak inspiratory pressure, which is set. You're the controller right now because this is open loop. You're the controller. So we know that this is a setting. It's not going to change. Our XL tidal volume is 420. At 10 o'clock, still on an inspiratory pressure of 20, tidal volumes are down to 390. At 12 o'clock, tidal volumes have dropped to 370. At 2 o'clock, tidal volumes have dropped to 350. Our peak inspiratory pressure that is set stayed 20 the entire time. Why? Because we didn't change it. This is the resulting thing that has happened. Now, what does this tell us about our patient's compliance for this patient in pressure control? Everybody knows, decreasing compliance again, right? As compliance decreases in pressure control, guess what? Volumes will decrease. And we recognize that. Now, we also need to be sure here that 
This could also be a rise in airway resistance, an increasing airway resistance. So if you had a, pa a post-op patient and asthmatic and they became uh, acutely bronchospasmic, then you would see the same pattern happen here related to airway resistance. But again, we see and we can assess that we're really good at knowing what's going on here. We got to dive deeper into it to figure out what the problem is and what changes we need to make because nothing different is going to happen until we do. All right. So let's flip the script a little bit. 70 kilogram patient, continuous mechanical ventilation. Now we are in PRVC. We have set a target or a desired tidal volume at six mLs per kilogram, which is 420 mLs. Previous eight hours give us this data. Eight o'clock, we got a peak inspiratory pressure of 20 and an exhale tidal volume of 420. At 10 o'clock, our peak inspiratory pressure is now 22, tidal volume 420. At 12 o'clock, inspiratory pressure 24, tidal volume 420. At two o'clock, inspiratory pressure 26, tidal volume 420. What does this tell us about our patient? tells us the same thing that we have known over the last scenario. But you see what the change, what, what changed here is that as respiratory therapists, we're really good at taking care of pressure control ventilation and recognizing a decrease in volume is going to tell us that we have an increasing resistance or a decrease in compliance. But when we go into a closed loop mode of mechanical ventilation that is targeting a tidal volume, in the pressure control mode, then we recognize that the telltale sign here are these increasing pressures. Because yes, we're getting the same tidal volume because we told the vent to ensure that tidal volume. We told the ventilator, make sure you target a tidal volume of 420. So my point here is, is that in pressure regulated volume control, PRVC, your exhaled volumes, are not as valuable to you as monitoring the peak inspiratory pressure changes. If your peak inspiratory pressures are going up, then you have a change in compliance or airway resistance. And yeah, your volumes didn't change because they're not going to. So you have to recognize how, when I'm in PRVC, shift my mind to understanding the change in this pressure is what I need to be monitoring for compliance and resistance changes. Okay, let's talk about a patient who's in the pressure support mode. Okay, same story, 70 kilogram patient, pressure support mode, preceding eight hours reveal the following. Eight o'clock, we have a pressure support of 10, exhale tide volume of 420 and a rate of 18. We got a minute ventilation of seven and a half liters here. At 10 o'clock, pressure support's 10. Tidal volumes have gone down, rate has gone up. Why? because the patient, for whatever reason, is able to now generate smaller tide. They're not able to generate those same 420s. So their tidal volumes have gone down, their rate has gone up in an attempt to sustain the seven and a half liter minute ventilation that the neural drive is trying to do to get rid of CO2. At 12 o'clock, tidal volumes are even further down with the same pressure support and our rates even higher, still a minute ventilation of seven and a half, but we see that this patient is obviously declining. Two o'clock, pressure support is 10, tide of arms is 250. Patient's now breathing 30 times a minute. Minute ventilation is still seven and a half liters. But our patient is clearly not doing well, right? How are we going to fix this patient? Are we going to extubate this patient? Probably not. We have a worsening RSBI. This does not look good for the patient, at least in the short term. Something is going on that is impeding their ability to sustain an adequate tidal volume at an acceptable rate. The vent isn't gonna do anything different about it though. These are our clues right here. Our tidal volume and our rate because pressure support ventilation is an open loop mode of mechanical ventilation. You're the controller. Let's look at volume assured pressure support. This is the mode now, same scenario, eight hours, here we go, eight o'clock, pressure support is 10, tidal volume is 420, respiratory rate is 18. 10 o'clock, pressure support has gone up, 
Tidal volume still 420, rate still 18. Same minute ventilation, 12 o'clock. Fresh report has gone up even more. Tidal volume still 420, rate still 18. Minute ventilation is still seven and a half liters. And at two o'clock, pressure support is up to 22. Tidal volume still 420, rate is still 18. What's going on here? The same thing that was going on in the last scenario. Let's go back and look at it. This scenario, the pressure support didn't change. Therefore, as the patient fatigued, their tidal volumes went down and their rate went up. Okay, but now in VAPS, since we know in VAPS, we will tell the ventilator what volume to target. So obviously we have told this vent to target 420 mLs. So as this patient tires and can no longer sustain the tidal volumes they are trying to pull and the effect of tidal volumes, then the closed loop mode of mechanical ventilation says, turn up the pressure support, turn up the pressure support turn up the pressure support. And see, what we don't see here is that this time between here, tidal volumes were falling below the target tidal volume. So the ventilator said, we got to up pressure support. We got to up it. And ultimately we find a patient spontaneously breathing, rate of 18, tidal volume of 420. But if you choose to extubate this patient, failing to recognize the fatigue that is present, you're probably not going to have a real successful extubation because this patient is requiring 22 centimeters of water pressure of pressure support to achieve that tidal volume of 420, which is why they can keep their rate at 18. Okay, this is very interesting to me because if we just fall victim to looking at this, like we got used to doing when pressure support ventilation was the only mode of spontaneous ventilation, then we're failing our patients when it comes to outcomes. Uh, we got a patient in ASV. I only got a couple more of these and we'll shut it down. Uh, we're getting here to the near here, so to the end here. So bear with me here just a few more minutes. Now we have a patient in ASV. Now remember, I told you ASV will move from spontaneous to full support on its own. Okay, so let's look at this. At eight o'clock, you have a patient with a pressure support of 10. Peak inspiratory pressure is happening at zero. Now, what this tells me is, is that there are no pressure control breaths happening right now. The patient is generating all of this 18 times a minute, tidal volume of 420, and this pressure support of 10 is sufficient for them right now. But at 10 o'clock, our pressure support has gone up. We're still not providing any mandatory breaths, but look what's happened. Our tidal volumes are still assured but we've lost on our rate side. What's this gonna to do to our minute ventilation? It's gonna drop. So we've gone from a minute ventilation to seven and a half, which was in the target for ASV to 4.2. ASV at this point in time is going to say, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This, 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 this minute ventilation right here is not acceptable. So I need to provide some full mechanical support to this patient. So at 12 o'clock, we see pressure support is even higher because the patient may still be generating some breaths, but the vent is now providing some pressure control breaths as well. These are targeting 420, and we're back to our minute ventilation of seven and a half liters. So here we have a combination of patient support happening alongside of the ventilator saying, hey, we're gonna provide full mechanical support and pressure control breaths so that we can sustain this minute ventilation. And then at two o'clock, Look, pressure support is zero. No spontaneous breaths are happening. It's all pressure control. Tidal volume is coming back 420, rated 18, seven and a half minute ventilation. The vent is in full control now. So what happened? Well, we don't know. Various factors could be. But let's just say that somewhere in here, the patient got a little anxious and maybe a little push of fentanyl was given. And then maybe somewhere in here, that push wore off and the patient got really, really crazy and really, um, um, you know, out of control. They're, they're the bucking event. They're fighting, trying to extubate themselves. And, and without us being there, maybe perhaps they get uh, the propofol started back up and, and fentanyl drip started back up. And now their respiratory drive has gone to zero or minimized. And now we have no spontaneous efforts. But look, the vent is still 
taking care and providing minute ventilation for that patient in pressure control breaths. Now, hopefully this doesn't ever happen. What I want you to recognize is, is that this whole process, if you put it down into a 45 minute window, instead of an eight hour window, make, put it into a 45 minute window while you are with a patient in MRI. This happens without you be, even being in the room. So that, 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 that nurse call, hey, I'm, pushing, I'm restarting propofol and fentanyl. And, and we, need, we need, you know, uh, to get this person back into a full mode of mechanical ventilation. In ASV, closed loop, it's going to happen automatically. So this is interesting to me as well. Last one here, um, and then we got one troubleshooting I want to show you. This is going to talk about NAVA. I just got three six hours, well, it says eight hours, but it's actually only six hours. Um, at eight o'clock, the patient's breathing with a pressure support of 14. No pressure control breaths are happening. Patient's generating 420 and a respiratory rate of 18. Now look, the pressure support at 10 o'clock is decreased because our tidal volumes now are bigger, our rate is slower, and the vent says, well, this is bigger than what our target is, so we don't need as much pressure support, so it turns it down. This patient looks like they're about ready to extubate. Now, we had the whole picture in front of us. We could put it together. But let's just say you're looking at this and you're going, hey, this patient, this patient is ready to extubate. You come back at 12 o'clock. Now there's no spontaneous breaths happening because the pressure, there's no pressure support breaths happening. Now we're in pressure control ventilation, getting tidal volumes of 420 and a rate of 18. What happened? Well, maybe that propofol story again. Maybe that fentanyl story again. Or perhaps, remember when you're working with NAVA, if that esophageal probe becomes dislodged and away from the crux of the diaphragm, then it cannot detect the contractions of the diaphragm. Then the ventilator says, uh, patient's not breathing. And so I'm going to provide full pressure control mode of mechanical ventilation targeting a tidal volume. So you got to be able to troubleshoot this. So you just don't go, oh, they must have got some propofol. No, what is it? Is Maybe they turn the patient, like I said, that esophageal probe got dislodged. Now, we may be looking at this and going, you know what, this all sounds good. Or maybe you're thinking it sounds bad. I'm not sure. But when I talk about closed loop ventilation and I talk about pressure control varying automatically to achieve a target tidal volume, a lot of people go, well, why don't we just do that all the time? Sounds like a good idea, right? Well, let's look at one scenario here before we wrap this up. Back to PRVC mode, 70 kilogram male patient receiving semen in a PRVC mode. We got our desired or our target tidal volume set at 420 mLs. This is key. The patient appears in respiratory distress, okay? So they don't look comfortable. And you look back over the last eight hours, and this is what you find. At eight o'clock, pressure was 20, tidal volume was 650. Wait a second. I thought we were targeting 420. Well, we were, which is why the vent turned down the pressure. And when the pressure got turned down, tidal volume way, 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 way. Tidal volume went up to 675. This doesn't add, this isn't adding up right here. Hang with me, okay? This is greater than 420. So what does the vent do? Turns down to 12. Tidal volume now 700. What's the vent going to do? Turn down the pressure. Tidal volume now 725. We see that we have decreasing pressures here, right? This appears to be an increasing compliance. But why does the patient look in distress? Well, let's talk about this for a second. When you have a patient with an increased neural drive to breathe, sending a greater strength to the diaphragm, that diaphragm contracts harder. It drops faster. This is common with asynchronies. We find our patients flow hungry all the time. Their diaphragm is dropping faster than the breath is coming in. Well, what happens when the diaphragm drops Intrathoracically, we get a decrease in pressure. That increases compliance. The faster it drops, the more negative intrathoracic pressure becomes, and the even more compliant the lungs become. So perhaps what we have here is a patient that at 8 o'clock was not neurally satisfied with the settings from the ventilator and was flow hungry and wanted more flow. Now remember, PRVC 
is a pressure control mode of mechanical ventilation where flow varies based off of the achieving of the pressure. If you want more flow, you have to increase the pressure. So what we have here is a flow hungry patient in PRVC and the vent is analyzing this going, whoa, 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 too much pressure because our volumes are too high. So it turns down the pressure, which in turn turns down the flow. Patient becomes even more distressed because I'm wanting more flow. You're giving me less flow from breath to breath over time. You are taking flow away from me when I want more of it. So I am becoming even more distressed. My diaphragm is dropping even faster and harder. And that's why we're getting higher volumes with less pressures because of the patient's neural distress. Here's our summary of all of this. Remember the five questions of mechanical ventilation. Are we employing protective strategies? Are we adequately ventilating? Are we adequately oxygenating? Are we meeting our, person, our patient's neural drive to breathe, their neural demand by reducing the presence of asynchronies? And number five, are our patients, or is this patient I'm standing in front of right now, are they getting better or worse? If you'll ask yourself that in front of every single patient, I think it will lead, not, 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 not just to you guys here, but to the students I teach. If I can get them to ask themselves those five questions, I think they'll become better critical thinkers, more important, more involved with the care plan and, and more valuable to our patients. Remember open loop ventilation, you are the controller. You have to make changes to the vent for it to do something different. If you don't, it won't. It'll continue to do the same thing. Closed loop ventilation, you as the clinician now tell the ventilator what to target. So the controller becomes a setting and the ventilator will make the adjustments automatically within the feedback it is receiving from the patient. Things like PRVC, ASV, NAVA, VAPS, all of those are types of closed loop ventilation. But don't be afraid of closed loop ventilation because the one thing it cannot do is interpret data. It cannot assess and critically think about why is the volume going down? Why are, are, are pressures changing? Why? You know the whys as a respiratory therapist. So you have value in all of these, no matter what ventilator comes our way. These are our, my references. I know you cannot read all this, but if you would like a copy of them, I can get that to you. And to get that to you, all you have to do is reach out to me. You can find me on all the socials, Respiratory Coach at Instagram, Respiratory Coach on TikTok. Have a lot of fun over there. Twitter at Coach RRT. Send me an email, respiratorycoach at gmail.com. If you ever want to just ask a question or have concerns or want to just reach out to me, that's how you can reach me via email. And then if you will, I have a texting platform that I send out occasional educational, motivational, inspirational messages. I'll tell you happy birthday if you put your happy birthday date in there uh, on, on when you register for this. This is a texting platform only. Do not call the number because you will get a message that says this is only a texting platform. And it is also not a group texting platform. So you will not be inundated with a bunch of messages from a bunch of people you don't know. It's gonna strictly be between me and you. 817-968-7035. This took longer than I thought it was. But I'm under time uh, with three minutes to spare to answer any questions. I do appreciate you being here. Uh, and I hope you learned something here today. And so at this time, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, turn your mic on or put them in the Q&A section.